So hopefully you can sh see this screen now. Um, if you don't mind, maybe putting a little thumbs up or high five or we something do. like Looks that. We do, looks great. Yeah, okay, there, yeah, perfect. It's, it's all good. All yeah, right, well, I'll go ahead and make it big. And um, I will try to go through this a little bit quickly. I, I do have a lot of slides and a lot to cover, um, but uh, you know, I, I realize it's already getting late. So if you do need to leave, I won't be offended, um, but hopefully you can stick around. So I'm just, I'm gonna just start off um, talking a little bit about vitamin E and then we'll talk about some diseases, but then the primary focus of this talk is gonna be about dietary vitamin E and selenium. So just to give a little bit of a a, a review about vitamin E and uh, selenium. Basically, this all comes down to muscle physiology and oxidative stress. And so to give you a little bit of a refresher from our muscle physiology, basically we have that action potential is going to um, release acetylcholine, which is going to activate an action potential at the sarcolemma. And that is going to transmit down the T-tubule and activate the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. That calcium is going to bind to troponin and cause a conformational change in the tropomyosin. And that exposes the binding site so that myosin and actin can go ahead and bind. Um, that myosin is going to start uh, the process pre-charged with a uh, high energy phosphate. And when it does its uh, sort of shift or the power stroke, we're going to remove that adenosine diphosphate and that high energy phosphate. And so we have this movement of the cross bridges, which is going to ultimately shorten the muscle. And then we're going to need ATP if we're going to recharge myosin and have work continue over and over again and the muscle getting contracted and relaxing and then contracting and relaxing over time. So of course, if we need the muscle to contract, then we need more ATP. And so ATP can be synthesized from either glucose or glycogen coming through the uh, glycolysis, or it can, uh, which will go in through via pyruvate and then into acetylcholine or uh, uh, acetate CoA. Um, and that's going to enter in the Krebs cycle. And here we can also have fat primarily, which is the other major energy source for our muscles, can come in and start acting through the Krebs cycle. And that's going to produce additional ATP, as well as our very important um, high energy phosphate compounds, our NADH and our FADH2. As well, we also produce a little bit of NADH within glycolysis. And these are going to feed into the electron transport chain. So as these, the NADH and the FADH go and donate their hydrogens, their extra hydrogens, those are going to be uh, pumped through to the inner mitochondrial membrane. And that's going to create the gradient of hydrogen within this inner mitochondrial membrane space. And then that uh, hydrogen is going to go through the um, ATPase synthase uh, portion of the um, electron transport chain. And that is going to use oxygen and also create uh, water as well as the ATP. And so normally this is a very set system where we're going to be pumping the hydrogens and electrons of course are also going to transfer through this chain. But every once in a while, we'll have some electrons that leak back into that mitochondrial membrane, as you can see here. And when this happens, these can react with oxygen to produce a superoxide, uh, which you can see here, and that can be converted to hydrogen peroxide. Um, both of these can cause significant damage to proteins and lipids, and ultimately these are causing oxidative stress. And so here are just a couple different uh, reactive oxygen species that can be uh, produced through this process, as well as what's happening through uh, lipid peroxidation, where we can have some additional um, hydrogens and oxygens um, creating these uh, lipid peroxides, as we see coming through here. And so these reactive oxygen species can ultimately cause some damage to the cells and ultimately to uh, DNA, and that can lead to all kinds of various disease processes. 
And so there have been several studies that have shown that various types of exercise has, uh, is able to induce oxidative stress. So here are a couple studies um, in horses. So this was uh, three different sets of exercise, pre-exercise, five minutes after, 30 minutes after, two hours after, and 24 hours. And so these are lipid um, uh, hydroperoxidize, peroxide, sorry. And so those are uh, going to be, uh, and the different bars are for after each of these different uh, standardized um, exercise tests that were performed. And so you can see immediately after exercise, um, those uh, uh, hyper uh, hydrogen uh, peroxides were increasing after exercise, and there's a bit of a tendency for them to be higher after that third set of exercise. Um, these T bars, those are thiobarbituric uh, uh, acid reactive substances, and basically they are products of uh, lipid peroxidation. And so again, this was a different types of uh, prolonged exercise. Um, where you could see that these uh, reactive uh, species increased following exercise. Another study here, this is looking at plasma uh, nitric oxide, which was um, whoops, present over here. And so that's also going to be uh, increased, as you can see, with various um, exercise uh, in the post-exercise period. And so these are all just demonstrating that exercise can induce oxidative stress. Now, it's not just exercise that produces oxi oxidative stress. Of course, these types of reactions and the electron transport chain and ATP production is also going on at rest. But certainly if we have athletic horses, then we can see the ability for uh, increased amounts of these reactive, reactive oxygen species being produced. And so in addition to producing the oxidative stress, we also can see some uh, changes or some induction in actual muscle damage. And so, for example, we all know that creatine kinase can be an indicator of muscle damage as well as AST. And so we can see this was after a 50-minute exercise bout, and you can see the increases in AST as well as creatine kinase after um, exercise compared to what would be a normal range. And then this was in endurance horses, um, either 70 or 100 kilometer endurance rides. And so you can see here that the horses that were able to finish, uh, you can see that that AST activity was quite high in those horses, especially compared to sort of at the start of exercise. So basically we're starting to see and realize that oxidative stress is induced by exercise and it can be uh, induced by speed and, and it's going to be affected by the various levels of intensity, uh, jumping exercise, pretty much um, all types of equine activity at high intensity is able to induce oxidative stress. We also know that there could be some influence, influence of age as well uh, with older horses naturally showing some higher levels of oxidative stress. And we also might see some differences based on gender. There were a couple studies that were perhaps less conclusive, but did suggest that uh, female horses had a little bit more oxidative stress than geldings. Now, I want to point out that oxidative stress isn't always a bad thing. It is important to actually trigger muscle development, which is part of what we want with our athletes. Um, but we have to make sure that we keep it in balance. And so this is the role of our antioxidants. So of course, we have some kind of stable chemical within the body. We're going to have it be oxidized by some of these free radicals and sorry, produce these various free radicals and reactive oxygen species. And then we have an antioxidant that basically goes and restabilizes these different chemicals. And so these figures are just showing a couple of the different ways that um, some of our very common antioxidants work. So in this slide, we're showing how selenium works. It's going to work with the enzyme glutathione peroxidase, which is basically going to take these peroxides and convert them back into water. Also, if these peroxides um, were not stabilized by the glutathione peroxidase, we would have additional free radicals and vitamin E is very important in neutralizing these free radicals. And so if we have these systems unchecked, we're going to have this oxidative stress and cellular damage. But if we have plenty of selenium and vitamin E, we wind up having less 
cellular damage. I also want to point out that selenium and vitamin E don't only work alone. Um, vitamin C and beta carotene are both important uh, antioxidants for the horse. Vitamin C is a little bit interesting because horses technically don't have a dietary need for vitamin C because they are able to synthesize it on their own in their liver. Uh, however, many older horses are supplemented with additional vitamin C and that's because there was one study that came out um, probably in the early 90s now, maybe it was even the late 80s that showed that older horses had lower vitamin C status. And we don't know if that's because the vitamin C was used quicker and so there was less of it available or perhaps a horse was not, unable to synthesize it as well as they got older. So if you're looking at uh, feeds for older horses, you will see that vitamin C has been added. There's also some research to suggest that you don't necessarily want to add vitamin C to diets of horses who already are I, presumably still able to produce vitamin C because it might stop them from being able to produce it. And then you'd always have to provide vitamin C in their diet. Uh, beta, beta carotene, of course, is a precursor to vitamin A, um, but beta carotene itself is a very good uh, antioxidant as well. But of course, we are going to focus on our vitamin E and selenium. And so again, ideally we have, we have a situation where any of our uh, reactive oxygen species, our oxidative stress is being held in balance with the antioxidants that we're providing for in the horse's diet. But when we do have a uh, mismatch between the amount of antioxidants and the reactive oxygen species, then this is when we do have indeed oxidative stress and that can lead to disease. So let's talk about uh, vitamin E and selenium and some of the diseases that we do see associated with these. And so uh, you probably all know more than I do about these. Um, and a very good couple of sources, of course, would be Dr. Valberg's lab in Minnesota. And then also um, Dr. Fino from University of California, Davis. Um, but there are a few different uh, muscle disorders in particular. Um, that are associated with potentially lower intakes of vitamin E and selenium. And of course, one that's fairly well recognized and has been for a while is nutritional myodegeneration. And this is better known as white muscle disease. And this is a disease that we see primarily in our growing foals. And we do know that it is a result of having deficient selenium and likely deficient vitamin E in their diets. Uh, now these uh, horses, when you're uh, going and doing some clinical work on them and doing some blood testing perhaps, typically we are going to see relatively low whole blood selenium and or low uh, vitamin A, the alpha tocopherol. And many of these horses, however, uh, if you do realize that they are low in selenium and vitamin E, uh, they don't always respond to dietary treatment. And this is in particular because these are relatively young horses and uh, they're, this is sort of the first muscle that they're actually developing. And if it's not uh, being formed properly, then it might uh, you know, be a lifelong condition or uh, result in euthanize, euthanasia. Another disorder that we see in primarily our younger horses is uh, the neuroaxonal dystrophy or ENAD or equine degenerative myoencephalopathy encephalopathy or EDM. Now these are actually two closely related diseases, but they are associated with nerve damage that we see. Um, and again, this is going to be something that we see primarily in our younger horses. It is believed that there's a genetic component. And in fact, Dr. Fino, who's at UCD is a geneticist who's trying to identify uh, the genetic link within this disease. However, it is also be believed that these uh, conditions uh, are also associated with low vitamin E because when we analyze their blood, uh, they do tend to be a little bit low. Um, these horses don't necessarily respond to treatment either. And so uh, it's a little bit unknown if perhaps there's a, uh, you know, a disease of vitamin E metabolism. So then that would be the genetic component. Uh, so there's a lot of research going into these different conditions. Uh, something that we see more in our adult horses is one condition that we call vitamin E responsive myopathy. 
And this is one where we see some uh, muscle wasting and weakness, but there's no dirt nerve damage. So it's a little bit easier for these horses to be responsive to supplemental vitamin E. So if you are doing looking at the clinical signs in addition to blood work, we do see that they have lower vitamin E concentrations. And then if you are able to intervene and supplement with vitamin E, these horses do tend to have a full recovery. Now from here, these horses can also perhaps um, develop equine motor neuron disease. And so this would be uh, continuing if they had low vitamin E status in their blood, then it goes beyond their muscles and it's going to start to affect their uh, nerves as well. Um, and this is believed to be a little bit more of an acquired disease uh, after significant amounts of time. Um, oops, sorry, this one here. Um, where we see uh, sort of this uh, dietary deficiency of vitamin E, low blood vitamin E. Um, it has expanded from the, uh, the um, vitamin E myopathy to this uh, neural disease. Uh, and these horses do tend to do okay or a little bit better if you are supplementing with quite a bit of uh, vitamin E. Um, although depending on the extent of the damage, there might be some longer lasting effects. Now also to point out selenium deficiency, really the, the condition that we see with selenium deficiency is white muscle disease, which um, you know we do think of it primarily as a selenium deficiency disease, but again, we see vitamin E deficiency as well. And so it's kind of believed that both of uh, deficiencies in both of these nutrients will contribute to white muscle disease. And of course, these horses are going to uh, develop some atrophy uh, in coordination and, and have some difficulty getting up and lying down as well as difficulty swallowing. And so we do see this in, in some horses that have decent vitamin E status, but low selenium, or perhaps where we've got marginal intakes in both of these. Now on the flip side, if we look at vitamin E toxicity, we really don't have too many uh, reports of any vitamin E toxicity. Um, the, there are some uh, suggestions that we want to avoid more than 10,000 um, international units per day, um, but we really haven't seen a documented case where vitamin E has caused a toxic reaction in our horses, which is a little surprising compared to our other fat-soluble vitamins. Uh, but there was one study that was looking at um, uh, in uh, cross-country horses, uh, and they were looking at how many supplements all of these horses were getting. And what they did find was that in horses that had very high intakes of vitamin E, they tended to have lower uh, levels, lower concentrations of some other vitamins within their blood, in particular vitamin A. So it's possible that there might be some disturbances to metabolism if you do feed too much uh, vitamin E. Now, of course, we all know that selenium is highly toxic. In fact, the upper safe limit is considered to be about 20 milligrams per day. Now, when we see selenium toxicity, we either see it as an acute situation or more of a chronic situation. Um, when we see it acutely, it's usually because a horse has consumed an accumulator plant, and I'll mention these a little bit more, um, but these are plants that will specifically absorb selenium out of the soil and incorporate selenium into uh, various amino acids in place of sulfur. And so they wind up having very high selenium concentrations. And the horses that do consume these have uh, what we know as blind staggers, where the horses will appear blind, lose their sight, they will present some um, different behaviors like head pressing, maybe some colic types of situ uh, symptoms. Uh, perhaps what's per a little bit more common, depending on where uh, your horses are located, um, we might have some um, uh, more chronic situations of selenium toxicity. And this would be a chronic long-term overconsumption, usually because people are over supplementing. Uh, when we do have a chronic selenium toxicity, we have a disease called alkali disease. And it's quite uh, striking and obvious. Horses will lose hair quite rapidly and we'll see the cracking of the hooves just below that coronary band, as you can see in this picture right here. 
So let's talk about our dietary vitamin E and selenium sources so that ideally we can find a good fit to prevent some of these diseases as well as uh, fend off any kind of oxidative stress for our horses. So uh, the National Research Council uh, is the organization and the group that has uh, gone and set nutrient requirements for horses. Now, the most recent edition was in 2007, which I remember fondly when it finally came out, um, and yet it seems so long ago already. And that uh, went and suggested that the values for a 500 kilogram horse would be one milligram per day for selenium, and then vitamin E was between 500 international units up to 1,000 international units, depending on what the horse was doing. Now, there has been some research since then to suggest that these are perhaps a little bit too low. And a newer, more accurate uh, requirement would be about two to three milligrams of selenium per day and vitamin E at closer to 1,000 international units or even a little bit higher in some situations. So let's talk about the different forms of vitamin E. So there are actually eight nat nat natural forms. We have the alpha, beta, delta, and gamma forms of both uh, tocopherol and tocotrienol. And so I've got a couple little pictures of these here. Um, this is the tocopherol, and then this is the tocotrienol. And then the alpha terms um, are going to relate to where we've got some of these different uh, bonds. So the most common form that we feed our horses and that we see in um, the sort of feeds that we're offering our horses are, is going to be this RRR or racemic alpha tocopherol, which is also known as D-alpha tocopherol. And it has a biologic activity of 1.4, oh, sorry, 1.49 international units per milligram. And that racemic just refers refers to the uh, stereoisomer uh, form of this uh, vitamin. Now, vitamin E, again, is going to be in several things that our horses are eating, uh, primarily pasture. Uh, we do see between uh, 30 to 100 micro, micro units per kilogram on a dry matter basis of pasture, but this is going to vary significantly. And this graph is actually from Western Canada, and so this is looking at plasma vitamin E concentrations, and you can see how much they varied throughout the year, and these horses were at pasture, so you can see that in the summer months where pasture was actively growing and plentiful, the vitamin E concentrations within the horse's blood was, is relatively high. Now, of course, pasture is the fresh living plant, and when we you go and cut it to produce hay, those values um, of vitamin E within the plant are going to decrease quite rapidly and uh, will continue to decrease over storage to the point that after about 12 weeks of storage, we start to see very little vitamin A activity at all. And if you're certainly feeding hay that is more than six months or even more than a year old, you can presume that there is zero vitamin E in that hay. Our various cereal grains, oats, corn, barley, et cetera, will have a little bit of vitamin E, about 20 to 30 international units per kilogram on a dry matter basis. So when we have vitamin E supplemented into our horse's diets, we need to remember that vitamin E is a fat soluble vitamin. And so it doesn't have a very good shelf life. And so all vitamin E that's going to be supplemented into our horse's diets is going to be stabilized with various esters. And so there are two different ways that we can create these esters. One of them is with the alpha tocopherol acetate. And then one form that's uh, much less common is the alpha tocopherol succinate. When we, and so again, the acetate is gonna be the more common form that we would see added into our horses. And we can have a natural source so that would be, again, the RRR or the D, alpha tocopherol acetate. And it's got a, a biologic activity that's a little bit lower than the uh, initial alpha tocopherol. We can also have a synthetic source, which is a little bit slightly different in its formation. And it has a biologic activity of one microunits per milligram. And so, again, these are either written as D or DL. 
So as you're looking at the ingredients of the different feeds or supplements, you can start to tell if it's natural source versus synthetic source. And again, we can have the same for our succinate, both the natural and synthetic source, although they're far less common that you will see in our equine diets. We can also produce a water soluble format of vitamin E. And so this is taking the natural form that D-alpha tocopherol acetate, um, but going and taking it so that it is water soluble. And that actually increases its biologic activity. And so this is a graph showing relative bioactivity for a 500,000 IU dose of vitamin E. And so you can see the natural acetate. So this would be this, um, the D, uh, alpha tocopherol acetate, and then this would be the natural alcohol. And we can see this one product here, the Nano E, uh, which is a brand name that is the water soluble vitamin E supplement. It's still a natural form of the vitamin, but they've just gone and um, sort of created these micelles uh, formation to make it water soluble. So it does actually have a slightly higher biologic activity. And this was another study where uh, these different uh, forms were fed to horses. And so there was a control, the acetate format, and then this is the water dispersion version, all given 5,000 5, IUs per day. And you can see very quickly, the horses that were fed the water soluble version had very high uh, serum alpha tocopherol concentrations quite quickly. They did go up with the acetate version and they were uh, obviously higher. Um, but the water soluble version was quite a bit more effective. So when we're looking at our different products, um, often the guaranteed analysis will list how many I use in the product so that we don't have to worry about the biologic activity because it's actually going to report the I use. Um, and they'll report it usually either per mil or per gram of serving or per serving that, you know, if it's a scoop, et cetera. Now in the ingredients, they may or may not list the form of that vitamin. So sometimes it might just say vitamin E, other times it will say that it's a natural source or a synthetic source. So I went and did some digging and I looked at some various products that I could find. And so one of them that's fairly popular is this Kentucky product uh, performance products, uh, which is called Elevate. And so this is a natural source of vitamin E. And so you can see the vitamin E is a thousand international units per cell, seven grams. And you can see within the ingredients, it is the D alpha tocopherol acetate. So it's that natural form of vitamin E and then some sugar mixed in as well. And so then this is showing how much should be supplemented for each horse. There is a water soluble version um, by Kentucky Performance Products. Um, I did see that in some places it was only available via veterinarian. And then when I looked somewhere else, uh, you could actually just buy it. So that might be different depending on what province you're in, in Canada versus uh, the US. Oops. Another product that I looked up was our wonderful Smart Pack. Um, said a little tongue in cheek, uh, but so each 15 gram serving provides 2,500 IUs of natural vitamin E. And so here you can see it's listed as D alpha tocopherol and how many units of vitamin E per uh, 15 gram serving. Another product, so this was the one that I referred to earlier. So this is Kentucky Equine Research and this is a water soluble format. And so it has 250 IUs per milliliter. And so depending again, how many you wanted to give your horse, then uh, that would uh, decide how many milliliters you'd be giving your horse. And so in the ingredients, it's listed as vitamin E, D alpha tocopherol. So again, it's telling you what form it is and it is in this uh, water soluble form. Now, another product, and there was no favoritism for any of the products, I don't work for anybody other than uh, the university. Um, but so this is one product here that had vitamin E per pound and then per serving or per half ounce. And all this re reported was vitamin E supplement. So it didn't indicate if it was a natural source or a synthetic source. And then finally, another one that I found was Equithrive vitamin E. And I apologize, it's a little bit um, 
uh, blurry with the writing. So um, one scoop provides a thousand international units of vitamin E. And then of course over here, it's the d alpha tocopherol acetate. Um, and this one also had some additional uh, essential fatty acids as well. And so you can see the other ingredients were listed there. So I went and said, well, if we wanted to supplement our horse with um, 2,500 IUs per day, and I apologize, these are in American units because that's where I was looking. Um, so the Elevate, um, again, these are both the natural vitamin E, then this Kentucky Equine Research Project with the water soluble was a little bit more expensive. Um, the Vitaflex E didn't indicate which form it was. And then the Equithrive, which had the natural vitamin E plus the omegas, um, and you can see that the Smart Pack uh, was actually the cheapest, and the water soluble product was a little bit more expensive. But if you're getting more bang for your buck in terms of its bioavailability, then uh, then that might be worth it, particularly if you've got a horse that has a uh, perhaps critical condition. In terms of various feeds that you might go and purchase, uh, commercial feeds, again, if you're looking at American feeds versus Canadian feeds expressed in IUs per kilogram or IU per pound, um, this is going to be listed, again, I apologize for the font size, so this has 500 IUs per pound, and this one has 150 IUs per pound. Of course, that's all going to depend on the serving size, so is your horse eating five to 10 pounds of the feed, or is it only eating one pound of the food then that is going to influence, of course, how much vitamin E they're getting. So I did go and look up some Canadian products. So um, the Equilibrium from Purina, uh, this had 1,000 IU per kilogram. And for the average horse, the feeding rate was about 0.555 kilograms per day. And so that would have generated 555 international units in that serving. One that was more designed for to be fed in higher amounts. So of course, this equalizer is more of what we would call a uh, not quite a balancer product, but uh, intended to be fed um, more for a maintenance type of horse without a whole lot of energy. Meanwhile, the Evolution Elite would be a little bit more for uh, an active type of horse where you might be feeding up to 2.5 kilograms of it. And so it's 300 international units per kilogram would give that horse 750 international units. And also it said vitamin E as opposed to what form of vitamin E. And I believe it did that also for the equilibrium. So it didn't actually indicate what form of vitamin E. And what I couldn't find out if that is a difference from um, AFCO labeling in the US and the Canadian food um, uh, officials um, in Canada, if it's required to indicate the specific form, or uh, sometimes the, the regulations for feeds versus supplements might be a little bit different. And so if you're actually feeding a vitamin E supplement purely for that form, um, then that might be more likely to include the form of that vitamin within it. So there was a nice study that was done a couple of years ago where um, horses were looked at um, whether or not they had um, pasture and no pasture, and then also if they had um, additional uh, vitamin E added to them. And so this graph over here on the left is horses that had no pasture whatsoever. And uh, 59 of these horses did not have any added uh, vitamin E or what was suggested to be insufficient vitamin E. And then these horses had synthetic vitamin E, these horses had a uh, natural vitamin E, and then 12 horses had both natural and synthetic forms of vitamin E. And then this is looking at the vitamin E concentrations within the blood. And typically we like to see, you know, around two micrograms per mil. And certainly um, the horses that had some vitamin E added into their diet specifically had higher levels of that plasma alpha tocopherol. Now over here, we had two groups of horses that did not have any vitamin E or had insufficient vitamin E added into their feeds. And then this is comparing horses that didn't have pasture versus those that did have pasture. And so you can see the horses that did have access to pasture had a little bit higher levels of vitamin E within their blood. And I do wanna point out that uh, even if horses, um, I probably should have men mentioned this earlier, because it is a, a, water, a fat soluble vitamin within the body, it is going to be stored within the adipose tissue. And so, 
if a horse has access to pasture throughout the summer and they have plentiful vitamin E, excess vitamin E will be stored in that adipose tissue. And then over the winter, if there is a relatively short period of time without added vitamin E, then they can use those reserves and they only start to see forms of symptoms of uh, deficiency after their reserves are, are also gone. And so these horses that uh, were at pasture, even if they were, um, you know, if these samples had been taken in the winter, if the pasture wasn't quite as good, um, they probably still did have some additional or slightly elevated uh, vitamin E simply from the pasture the previous season. In terms of natural dietary selenium, uh, we all know that selenium is uh, highly variable within the soil. And so how much selenium is in our plants is going to depend on where they were growing. And so this is gonna be true for both our grains and our forages. Now, if we are in primarily in Ontario, I don't know where my mouse is up here. You can see that if you are buying hay from anywhere in Ontario or Quebec, or even sort of the Northeastern part of the United States, you can see that there is quite low amounts of selenium with our soil. I'm down here in North Carolina, and we actually do have a little bit of some variability within the uh, selenium in our soil. Now, if you're further west uh, in Canada, and this was the only map that I found that actually included Canada, but of course it, it missed quite a big chunk of it. Um, but you can see that within sort of Alberta and Saskatchewan and um, Manitoba, depending on where you are, there was some uh, decent amounts of uh, selenium. And then these areas here, are some areas where those accumulator plants tend to live. And so we can see significantly higher concentrations of selenium in those plants. And again, we do have a few different uh, selenium accumulator plants. Uh, this here is milk vetch. And uh, so these ones are obligate selenium accumulators. So they will actually selectively accumulate selenium and actually push it into various amino acids in place of, um, of sulfur, and these are sort of more secondary. They'll still uh, accumulate some selenium, but not to the same degree as our obligate selenium plants will. So we do often see added selenium uh, to horses' diets. Um, we can see it as a couple different forms of inorganic. And in this case, I just mean it, that it's a salt form versus organic selenium, which is usually found as a yeast. Uh, or it's produced as a yeast, so it's believed to be more, and it is in fact more bioavailable, uh, research has shown that. Um, and so it's usually attached to methionine, which is uh, normally one of these uh, sulfur containing amino acids. And so the selenium is actually in place of one of those sulfurs to create the selenomethionine. And these have been proven to be more uh, bioavailable than um, plain old salt selenium. And so this is with that um, same study. Here we see horses that had no supplemental selenium, uh, some selenium, but insufficient, less than one milligram per day. These were horses that had the uh, sodium selenium. So these were actually found in salt blocks. And then we had horses that had the um, organic selenium here. Where's my mouse? Right here. And then we had horses that had a salt block and uh, the uh, organic form. And so you can see that whenever horses were fed primarily the organic form, the selenium methionine, uh, you can see that they had significantly higher concentrations of selenium within their blood. Uh, these two lines are kind of showing where uh, sort of marginal to low levels would be in the blood. Um, personally, I don't like having selenium added to salt blocks that would be available free choice because selenium can be toxic and there are some horses that like the taste of sodium, they would potentially consume too much of it. So I am not a fan of free choice selenium in a salt block, but certainly if the, the salt form is added to a feed or added in manually in known amounts per day, then that's okay. Um, but many different commercial feeds have the selenium methionine, the yeast form of it added to their feeds as well. So how do we know what is in our feeds? Um, vitamin E, there are very few places that will go and analyze for vitamin E. It's not as common as you might uh, test your feed for protein or various starches, um, but Eurofins uh, will test for vitamin E. Um, last time I checked, it was about $110 per uh, test. Uh, so a little bit pricey. 
Uh, selenium is also not typically included in a regular uh, feed analysis, um, but if you go, Equianalytical is a pretty common lab that we'll send most of our samples for. It's in Cornell um, or at Cornell in Ithaca, and it's $52 to measure specifically selenium. And I was able to find out that the animal health lab at Guelph would also measure selenium in the plants, but I couldn't get a price point for that. So we could go ahead and test the feeds and then we can do a little bit of math. So if a horse eats 10 kilograms of hay with three kilograms of Purina evolution and the hay has 10 international units per kilogram of vitamin E and 0 0.08 milligrams per kilogram selenium, and the grain has got 500 international units per kilogram of vitamin E and 0.4 milligrams per kilogram of selenium. We can go and add up all of the vitamin E that they're getting from both the hay and the grain, and we can add up the selenium that they're getting from both of those sources. And we can see that these horses are, would be getting, or this horse, for example, would be consuming um, 1600 IUs per day of vitamin E and two milligrams of selenium. We can also test the horse. Now, I, as a nutritionist, I always prefer to look at the diet, but as we do know, there are some horses that even if you provide them with plentiful vitamin E, they might still have some um, muscular disorders. And so it is relatively common to go and test the horse. And we do like to look at the serum, uh, or the serum samples. So um, be sure to use one of the uh, tubes that don't have the anticoagulant added to them. Um, it is uh, analyzed, you can do it at Guelph as well as Cornell. Um, and then depending on where you're uh, looking at your reports is either going to be reported in uh, micrograms per deciliter or um, micrograms, oops, um, micrograms per milliliter. And then you'll see that those units are just sort of shifted. Um, ideally working horses uh, should be ideally closer to six, um, but Again, you'll see most horses are sort of in that two to three uh, microgram per mil range. Um, but if you are perhaps, if you have a very hard working horse, um, then you could certainly try to increase it to get it a little bit higher. And it is possible to increase by adding 10,000 IUs per, per day for two weeks. And then you can give 7,000 IUs per day for two weeks. And then you can go ahead and retest. So if you did have a horse that you thought might have been marginal, you could go in and test them initially, put them on some added vitamin E, and then retest and make sure that um, they are actually responding to that uh, dietary vitamin E. In terms of selenium, we want to look at whole blood because those red blood cells are also going to have that activity for the glutathione peroxidase. And so you can use EDTA or heparin tubes. Again, we can measure this at both Cornell and Guelph. And an ideal range, um, would be uh, about 140 to 160 uh, nanograms per milliliter. Um, and then if it's, uh, and it might be a little bit lower in our foals. And so if you do find that they're a little bit low, then you can go and add three milligrams per day and then retest. Um, there have been cases where people wanted to actually do liver biopsies and certainly for some research projects that's been done. And so just for your own information, 1.2 to two micrograms uh, per gram of liver dry weight. You can also test for glutathione peroxidase activity. That's usually what um, researchers would do when we are looking at uh, perhaps the effectiveness of a supplement, we would be going and uh, adding selenium and then going and uh, you know measuring not just whole blood, but then also trying to see if it's impacting the antioxidant status of the horse. So now what about going above and beyond? Are there additional health benefits if we really start to get into higher amounts? And um, so do, will health and performance be enhanced if we supplement above the requirements? And so I always want to sort of come back to this where healthiness you know, is only going to go up to a certain level and if these are the nutrient intakes, so if this is uh, vitamin E or for selenium, uh, we do have this range for different types of horses. And so some horses, this might be perfectly sufficient. Other horses, this might be what they need. And as soon as you go beyond that for a particular horse, it's going to be wasteful. And so if you are feeding too much selenium, then is it coming out in the feces and not being absorbed? Or is it going in 
um, being excreted. Um, and potentially for some of our uh, nutrients, and so for example, selenium can in fact cause some levels of toxicity because once it's in the body, it's a little bit harder to get rid of selenium. And so this was a study that was looking at uh, sort of higher levels of vitamin E. So they were feeding um, synthetic vitamin E at 4,000 IUs per day or low synthetic at 1,000 IUs per day, and then 4,000 of this natural form that was mycelized, so that's this water soluble. And so we can see this is serum alpha tocopherol, and these were after two different uh, standardized exercise tests, so SCT1 and then SCT is over here. And so we can see this is the serum alpha tocopherol with the natural form, this water soluble is the black bars. And you can see that these increase both over time and with both of these, um, they've sort of stayed high even with the um, exercise tests. This is those T-bars that represent uh, lipid peroxidation. And so you can see that, um, you know, we, we didn't see a whole lot of difference. Um, we did see that they actually went up a little bit um, and were a little bit higher with the synthetic. Meanwhile, they stayed a little bit lower with that natural source, the water soluble source. So maybe there is this protective effect against some lipid peroxidation with um, a relatively high amount of this natural uh, but water soluble source. And then this is showing a TNF alpha, which is a relatively common uh, inflammatory cytokine. And so we can see that these didn't really reach um, scientific uh, um, statistical differences between them, although we did see a, um, there was a time effect. So over time, there were some differences, um, but uh, you can see again, the natural source, at least in some of these time periods, perhaps after this um, standard exercise test, it was a little bit lower. And so again, perhaps that natural source of vitamin E was in fact um, a little bit protective. Some other interesting studies regarding selenium, uh, one study where they offered four milligrams per day, it actually mitigated the effects of low vitamin E. And so these horses were fed um, only 100 microunits of vitamin E per day, but then were fed more selenium. And they actually had some um, uh, sort of improvements in terms of uh, mitochondrial capacity and um, less impairment as a response of oxidative stress. Um, also in sort of the same group of researchers did find that added selenium alters some um, antioxidant activity. Um, and again, sort of in a protective type of effect, although it really depended on which uh, system they were looking at. So it's certainly an area where some more research could be done. So it kind of comes down to the question, are these actually feeding over and above what the horse actually needs, or are these actually amounts that exercising horses truly need? Um, and so what is an actual requirement for a horse? And I think at this point, um, we have some, some basic guidelines, selenium, uh, you know, we probably want to feed at least one milligram per day still, but perhaps even two to three, certainly less than four milligrams per day. It was that 20 milligrams per day that was toxic. And that's relatively easy to achieve if you're feeding several different types of uh, supplements. We know you go off and you work with the client um, and they've got 20 different supplements that they're feeding their horses. And if you go and add all of them up, it's not uncommon for some of them to be feeding 15 milligrams of selenium per day. Now, vitamin E again is relatively non-toxic but probably want to stay less than 5,000 IUs per day, maybe in that, you know, sort of 3,000 uh, IUs uh, per day range, unless you have a horse that has a known uh, muscular or nervous disorder that you think might be helped with additional um, vitamin E. But again, I think we're kind of re-identifying what perhaps those National Research Council's nutrient requirements of horses actually are, and they probably are in fact a little bit higher than uh, what we first believed or what we believed even less than 20 years ago. And so with that, I'm glad to answer any questions. Um, I, I went through and dug out some photos from my old Guelph days. You might recognize um, the treadmill room. I think it's all being done, redone over there in the vet school. And then this was um, one of the labs over at the Equine Research Center. Um, terrible photo from my Lampton Hall freshman year days. And then my house on G Gordon Street that I, I lived in for my, my fun part of my undergraduate days. So I'm glad to answer any questions if you've got them. 
Well, thank you very much for a very like complete uh, physiology to the clinical picture a lecture on uh, these very important vitamin and minerals, especially in this part of the world. <clears throat> I am, uh, first of all, very grateful for your patience and the waiting and all these glitches with technology and um, apologies. I, I want to justify myself, but I won't do it. I just, uh, you know, it, it just happened. And I, uh, thank you to uh, our wonderful veterinarians in, in the chat for or in the webinar to, to, um, for being patient and being here and many of many uh, known names and I'm very happy to see people uh, you know like long friends um, Rudy and Dr. Bell and Stephanie etc. Stephanie Wellam has um, a, I guess I, I'm gonna read exactly what she said it said for easy mm -hmm. keeping horses on a forage based diet and no minimal added fat. If I am recommending the owner supplement vitamin E, should I also have them add a fat source to the meal? And if so, how much? Thank you. Well, thank yeah, you. so that's a great question. Um, so there is going to be some fat. So even forages will have a little bit of fat. And so that's believed to be enough to carry um, the fat soluble vitamins across. Um, and certainly if you have an easy keeping horse, you don't want to necessarily add a whole lot of fat because then that would increase their calorie intake. Um, if you were concerned, if you did have a horse that perhaps um, might be marginal in terms of blood concentrations, then maybe that would be the opportunity to go and find the water soluble form. Great. More questions from you guys? Otherwise I will start with some, but I'm sure there will be more questions for someone. So people in, in the webinar. So um, before some other people um, ask, um, my first question is, um, do you know what is the natural source of some of these vitamin E's? Because they, they says natural source, but they don't disclose the source. Right. No, that's a great question. And um, I, I'm not entirely sure where they get it from, but um, certainly some, um, uh, you know, various grain sources, et cetera, are going to have, you know, some higher levels of vitamin E. And so when they do oil extractions and things like that for corn or corn oil or other um, grain oils, they can extract them from those. And then certainly there are um, some some plants and other uh, nuts and things that do have extra vitamin E so they can extract it from those. Okay. Um, there's a question about um, selenium injections. Um, so that's a good question. Um, my, I would probably be more likely to, you know, as as part of the, the mayor, you know, as you're, you know, working with the vaccinations and things like that to get her ready for uh, parturition, I would certainly be looking at her diet and making sure that she has uh, sufficient vitamin E and selenium in her diet. And if you, if you didn't know, if it was full that um, came to you without much of a history, then that's probably not a bad idea. Um, although the injectable side is, is not really my, my area. I like to feed it. Can I follow up? Yeah. Because I think this is a very important question from Rose. We see, um, um, Shannon, a lot of falls that you don't necessarily see the, the full white muscle or, or your typical white muscle disease fall, mm -hmm. but you see weakness. Particularly, we see some uh, falls that they can, for example, not nurse well, or they <clears throat> that they will inhale. There's a paper from, I'm sure you've seen it from, um, from uh, Ohio State, in, oh, sorry, the Ohio State University. Right. Um, from Dr. Cohn, Catherine Cohn, where they describe this syndrome. And we actually see it quite often at Guelph, where right. these folks actually, uh, they cannot swallow properly. They have collapse of the, or the throat, or, you know, the pharynx, and um, they have milk, in, milk coming out of their, um, their nose. And you supplement them for a while, and they do great. You know, we feed them through yeah. a tube. For a number of days and they do fantastic and they're, they're 
I guess my final question is that I see your concern about overdoing the selenium, but mm -hmm. we're in a, in a very soil poor selenium area around the Great Lakes, as you know. Yeah. So please enlighten me and the and the people in the chat because we tend to say, you know, and these falls are really low when we measure. I can show you the data. They are like in really low levels when we mm -hmm. when they come to the clinic. Right. Yeah, so, um, you know, I know it is it is low in the, the di um, low in the soil, so it's going to be low in all of the fees that are from here. Um, and and so so, yeah, it you, again, if you are supplementing a commercial feed at well, so one of the you know, when you're looking at your commercial feeds that you're probably feeding your broodmares, uh, they, you know, it'll have, however, you know, how many mill milligrams per kilogram of feed, but it also says how much of that feed you're supposed to be giving. And I think a big problem is that people don't always feed the amounts that they're supposed to be giving. Um, and so then that's not count accounting for, um, you know, what, what should be in the diet. And so most of the feeds that are designed for, you know, in Ontario, for example, um, they are going to have sufficient selenium added to them as long as you're feeding the correct amount. And so if people aren't feeding the correct amount, which tends to be fairly common, um, then going and either adding more uh, in the diet or going and giving an injection can be a sort of a quick and an easy route um, and isn't, you know, I don't discredit it. It's certainly, um, you know, a very powerful option to do that. Um, of course, I would always just be trying to feed the mare better before that, but. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, you know, like, like anyway, I'm gonna use colostrum as an example. And I, this is mm -hmm. what I said to the student, you know, even if you think that the colostrum is a good quality, even if you think that the fall drinks it all, mm -hmm. um, just don't assume that it was all absorbed. You should always measure it. And mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just asking you because, you know, should we presume that because of the mare is having the right diet, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, that she is she's going to be having enough circulating level for herself and from the baby to, right. um, and, and, you know, I love to hear your, your thoughts about that. Yeah, um, well, so I, I do think there, so was, there was one study um, when I was in grad school in Kentucky um, Kristen Janicki did a, a nice work where they were feeding either the inorganic or the organic yeast form of selenium to the mares. And they were able to, in fact, increase the mares um, selenium content, the selenium content in the milk, the selenium status of the foals, as well as um, those horses, those foals had uh, higher levels of passive transfer too. Um, so I think it is something that should be, should be looked at. Um, as, right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Are there any other questions, please, from the from uh, the participants? Kelly, you you should ask something from up north. You can unmute yourself if you like. Um, Stephanie, uh, well, I'm asked again. Would those same selenium two or three milligrams per day and vitamin E uh, thousand to five thousand thousand units per day nutritional recommendations be used during the pregnancy and lactation as well? Yes. So if if you go into um, like the NRC and actually look at um, what the requirements are for um, during pregnancy, they do stay the same. Um, all, all the way through to, um, so I think there's a little bit of a, a higher level um, in, no, so selenium actually stays the same in terms of the current NRC requirements. Um, and so again, I think those are probably a little bit low uh, when you've got the mare going into lactating, I'm just pulling this up right now. Um, her, the selenium concentrations or the selenium requirements are the same, but it does increase those IUs up to a thousands for the vitamin E. So again, if we are talking about a pregnant mare, then yes, I would be increasing those, um, the, certainly the two to three milligrams per day 
And then, yeah, I would probably be looking at probably 2000 micro units per day. Again, um, because it's relatively safe, if you've got, you know, a broodmare and you're trying to produce a good quality foal that's going to be, you know, healthy, I think upping that vitamin E above what the, the NRC states is probably okay. Um, again, it's, it seems like it's old now and there's been enough uh, newer research to suggest that those requirements for vitamin E in particular were too low. Right. So Ross Romney got another uh, um, question and, and I don't know if it's going to be tricky for you to answer, but yeah. says that what vitamin E, maybe you can read it, E or supplements are on Tyrovet using right now? And maybe this is more for the chat people to also answer. Right. About two years ago, I tried to source some of the uh, care products for a client and without a connection in the States, I wasn't able to uh, get anything across the border. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure about that. I thought the Kentucky Performance Products was available to, um, to go and uh, feed. I know um, there's also the Mad Barn is sort of one of the newer nutrition companies and it has um, a couple of different um, vitamin E supplements. Um, I'm trying to find which their products are right now. Um, and again, not wanting to, to say one product versus next. Um, and then uh, Green Hawk, I guess would be the other place. I am fairly certain that Green Hawk, um, you can get it. And Stephanie answers, I have clients buy Kentucky Performance Products, uh, yeah. Water Solid E-Feed Stores, Sharpies and others. Yeah. So Sharps are around here, of course. Yeah. Uh, Elevate maintenance power also at feed stores. Um, so it looks like it's available, um, Rose. She said, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, that's great that, um, again, I, I kind of tried to look some up for um, where I could buy it online here, but it was just um, kind of sent me to the, yeah. main, the main website, so. Uh, yeah, for Rose and everybody else, I'm fairly certain that you can get them. I, I think, um, you know, um, it was, it was, a, there is a beautiful paper, I'm sure you, you know it, by, by uh, Carrie Finn about the vitamin E and, and when mm -hmm. she talks about different isoforms. Mm -hmm. And she presented an ICBIM and it was quite enlightening for me as well, and especially about the RRR forms. And I think that's, yeah. that's what we need to be fairly aware of. Um, and in general, I mean, we we go through this. Uh, Alison, I think, is in the in the chat as well. She can she can chip in. But uh, we have, for the most part, we have made most issues with selenium rather than vitamin E. But yeah. um, but of course, it, it it wouldn't it wouldn't hurt. You know, it's a great antioxidant, and why not? And I think that's uh, um, you know, uh, with our seasons here and eating like grass that has been processed and dry and why not we know that we have times of the year that they are going through to low levels for sure mm -hmm. yeah well and i think you know you mentioned the the different bioavailability so there was the one study which was kind of surprising because they were all giving the same amount of um you know this one so they were all giving 5,000 ius and so that water soluble was able to increase even more because you would think that the international units, um, you know, so if you were giving the same numbers of, of international units with these different forms, you would be giving different amounts in terms of milligrams because of the different bioavailability. So these two different types versus um, these ones here in terms of the uh, bioavailability. And so even though this water soluble form technically has the same bioavailability as the natural source, which was back up here. Um, somehow the water soluble was even better than the, the natural source. So 
Um, again, if you are sort of concerned about it, then that water soluble source might be even better. Hey, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Stephanie put something in the chat, tangent, but interested in the increase in vitamin C requirements for seniors. Is mm -hmm. there a clinical pathology check to determine if you should supplement? First question, or clinical concerns or guidelines mm -hmm. to just supplement for seniors? Um, is a keeper and only getting a ration balancer and not a senior feed? Thanks. Yeah, so that's a great question. So because vitamin C is not technically a vitamin for horses, there are no actual requirements for it. So, um, you know, I'm sure there's um, tests that you can do to look at the proper levels of ascorbic acid within the blood. Um, but from a nutritional standpoint, um, you know, we don't even know what a senior horse requires in terms of amount per day versus, you know, the average horse. Um, so I would probably suggest that if you are feeding a senior horse, um, well, de depending on the ration balancer, there are quite a few feeds that also have added ascorbic acid as well now, even if they aren't technically senior feeds. Um, but if you did have an older horse, it probably wouldn't um, be a bad idea to, you know, look into some of the formulations for supplements that are specifically designed for those older horses so that you can get a little bit of vitamin C in them, or just go and, you know, crush up some of the orange tablets that you used to give your kids. And there has been quite a lot of debate, and as you, as you put it, I think the vitamin C is being reclassified as a hormone rather than a vitamin, and, and you, please mm -hmm. back me up if you know about that, um, and whether or not we, we, we really need a lot or not, and I think um, um, there has been a lot of controversy, especially with COVID as well, as you probably yeah. know, with COVID, even um, ivermectin, you know, is coming into the right. chat probably, but um yeah, I think that that's a great topic, but I don't, I, I don't think, um, thank you for pointing that out. I don't think we have to worry too much about the vitamin C, um, but, um, you know, as you pointed out, uh, some of these minerals, we, we, we really have to be careful because they can be highly affected by diet and, mm -hmm. you know, chelators and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And vitamin C yeah, can affect iron absorption. And so if people are, for whatever reasons, which is completely unfounded, worried about iron in their horse's diet, um, you know, if vitamin C is, they're adding that, that actually can increase iron absorption and then I wouldn't do that, so. Um, in your last slide, I, I mm -hmm. saw a little red house, which I recognize. Do you really? <laughs> And the treadmill is exactly the same other than just it doesn't work at the moment um but that's okay. great yeah yeah this is 201 gordon street we lived there for three years wonderful i was lecturing yeah. this past week and then i asked the students if they like history and almost and about 90 percent of them they say no and i was huh. blown away because I, I think history is fantastic and not that you're historic i'm sorry about that <laughs> <laughs> but the point being that you know like your memories and things that are so important yeah but at the end of the uh, at the end of the talk one of the students which i was very touched by it she came he came and said i, I really love history and he said you can find a lot of um items in ebay about obc like postcards and things like that from 100 years ago Mm -hmm. And I actually did and, and looked and it was, uh, it wasn't, I mean, I'm being a, a proud OVC and uh, of course there are many OVC grads and teachers like Dr. Hertig is in the chat and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I was, uh, I, I was very, you know, sort of like um, interesting to see uh, what is out mm -hmm. there available in terms of kind of like um, historical items and that you can actually look and so on. But anyway, that right. I'm, I'm, sidetracking from your talk and why not um um uh I, what I, the last thing i want to say is that dr balber is not currently in minnesota anymore um yeah uh, she's retired yep. she is actually in michigan she's still working uh, oh the, yeah be... yes she is um yeah sorry i get confused with um uh, molly McHugh. um in terms because they both do quite a bit of uh, muscle genetics and yes 
So it's, it's a Lapis is still open and we send samples yeah. over there. And, um, and yeah. again, another, another piece of history. She's an OVC grad. She is, I knew that. 1987. And she tell the story that um, uh, Mimi Arrighi was, I think, her teacher. And she, um, you know, the only, uh, the muscle lecture she gave, the only thing she talked about was, uh, that, you know, uh, so like muscle damage due to exertion. So, Mm -hmm. uh, and then we are and now we have so many muscle diseases and so why not and, and you touch about some of these um kind of responsive you know like um treatments for these myopathies which is very impressive we have seen some cases over here mm -hmm. where the horses come with these like they're crippled really and mm -hmm. you treat them and they they come around yeah yeah i think as long as it doesn't get to like into the sort of the nervous tissue too much if it's just sort of within the muscle it seems to be able to rebound quite a bit but that's right I, and I, again these are not young horses like the one that you described for yeah. pdm or why not but yeah any other questions uh please um uh, you know feel free um dr wilchi is um usually like ask good rudy don't be shy um home is cleaner so um but I will not, it's getting late, but I have to um, give credit to, um, to Shannon that she, um, oh, somebody here is, uh, wants to ask something. I raise the hand, let me, um, um, can I unmute you here? So I, I don't have the power, I'm sorry. Um, That's Tanya, okay. Are you still in the I chat? Can you, can you, okay, there you go. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's okay. I uh, I am on my phone and I hit it by accident, but no, great, uh, great talk and great presentation. 